Hello, this is Annette Rebel from the University of Kentucky. In this presentation, we'll talk about the principles of neurophysiology, the basics, what you need to know for neuroanesthesia. For this presentation, I will assume that you have reviewed the contents and hopefully watched the video cast on neuroanatomy. So this presentation will focus on cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood flow regulation uh, in addressing the influences anesthetic pharmacology has on cerebral blood flow. And we'll talk about another unique features of uh, the central nervous system, meaning the blood-brain barrier and uh, ICP, intracranial pressure. So starting off with cerebral blood flow, It's approximately, as an average, 50 cc's per minute per 100 gram tissue. And that represents almost 20% of the cardiac output. Roughly 750 ml per minute goes through, of, of, of blood flow goes to the brain. As I said, this is an average. There are significant regional differences. White matter in the ballpark of 20 ml per minute uh, per 100 gram tissue. Obviously, the gray matter gets a significantly higher portion. The variations in the range of around 10 to up to 300 ml per minute per 100 gram tissue very much depend on the metabolic activity of the brain region, the brain tissue. But just give you a range of when to worry about cerebral blood flow. If it's less than 25 ml per minute, per 100 gram tissue, there's a likelihood of cerebral impairment, neuronal dysfunction. So a blood flow less than 20 ml per minute per 100 gram tissue uh, can be associated with an isoelectric EEG. And if it drops even further, lower than 10 ml per minute per 100 gram tissue, there is a likelihood of irreversible neuronal injury. But now since I'm talking about cerebral blood flow and you wonder kind of like, so how do we measure cerebral blood flow in the clinical arena? Well, we don't. The cerebral blood flow measurements are most invasive and used in an experimental setting to get exact numbers. So the publications where you see that, they're usually coming from bench research, lab environment, or more elaborate invasive uh, measurement techniques. So as a clinician, mostly we estimate cerebral blood flow. You can use transcranial Doppler to do that, or more commonly, functional assessment, meaning are the neurons working? And that's what you do with the EEG or evoked potentials. But please do not make the mistake to use cerebral blood flow synonymous with uh, cerebral perfusion pressures or mean arterial blood pressure. They're two different things. So the influence on cerebral blood flow, as I said, it's very closely affected by the uh, regional metabolic activity, your cerebral metabolic rate. Strong um, and very important factor for us to understand is the artery regulation of cerebral blood flow, and we'll talk about this in more specific. But obviously, perfusion pressures have an impact on cerebral blood flow. Uh, your blood gas composition, your partial pressures of uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen affect your cerebral blood flow. Um, anesthetic drugs have an influence on cerebral blood flow. Um, as we already said, cerebral blood flow is a portion of cardiac output, so obviously due to fluctuation or affected by fluctuation of cardiac output. And then sympathetic uh, nervous activity, probably also affected by the metabolic activity, um, but this has a high influence on cerebral blood flow. Think about the development of cerebral vasospasm or brainstorming, how cerebral blood flow fluctuates based on those states of uh, pathological uh, nervous activity. So very strong link between the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral metabolic rate, the CM 
RO2. The brain consumes, give or take, 20% of our body oxygen uh, as a range 3 to 4 cc's per minute per 100 gram tissue. The majority of this oxygen is used to generate ATP. So the regional relationship between cerebral blood flow and metabolic activity is called coupling, expressing that the neurons with the high metabolic activity will get the majority of perfusion. Therefore, since the uh, cerebral metabolic rate of the gray matter is much higher than the white matter, that explains the uh, redistribution of blood flow towards the higher metabolic activity uh, cells. Despite the high needs for oxygen, the brain has zero oxygen reserve, which means if you do not have any cerebral blood flow, your neurons can't function within 10 seconds and your ATP is depleted within 3 to 8 minutes causing irreversible cell injury. Some brain regions are more sensitive to those lack of oxygen supply. Uh, hippocampus and cortex are most sensitive to states of tissue hypoxia. In addition to oxygen also the uh, cerebral metabolic rate depends on your glucose supplies. Since glucose is the primary energy source, only in extreme states, meaning starvation, the brain shifts to the keto bodies, meaning acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Therefore, fluctuations of blood glucose levels very much affect the brain. The worst case scenario probably is a low supply of glucose, meaning hypoglycemia, which causes neuronal malfunction to the point of if there is no glucose, same thing than if there is no oxygen, can be cause irreversible neuronal death. However, also a high supply of glucose is not a good state for the brain. Hyperglycemia, um, and most studied in states of uh, 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 an addition of uh, cerebral ischemia, it can worsen um, global and focal hypoxic brain injury. Um, as you can, you know, like if there is no oxygen supply but glucose, this can uh, uh, cause the cell to enter a lot of pathological pathways which then worsens the cerebral uh, acidosis. Cerebral autoregulation is a very important concept for us to understand. Within um, the definition of autoregulation is that within a certain range of perfusion pressure, the cerebral blood flow is maintained constant despite variations in incoming perfusion pressure. The cerebral perfusion pressure, also like CPP, is a function of mean arterial blood pressure, MAP, minus intracranial pressure, ICP, or CVP, the central venous pressure, whichever one is higher. So why CPP is a function of the mean arterial blood pressure, it's not equal. So whenever you look at a graph, like what I you know, show over here, go like, please make sure that when you look at minutes, are they talking about MAP or are they talking about CPP? Assuming you have a normal intracranial pressure, give or take less than 10, and that's a linear difference between CPP and MAP, but it's not equal. So the normal autoregulation limits are within 50 to 100 millimeter mercury. Within those limits, the vascular diameter, the vasotone, compensates for the variation in incoming pressure to maintain the blood flow constant. So here at the lower limit, your, va your blood vessels are vasodilated. And then as the incoming pressure increases, your vascular diameter changes, gets smaller. And here up here is vasoconstriction, and so therefore reducing the 
uh, pressure to maintain a constant flow. Outside of these limits, cerebral blood flow, it's becoming pressure dependent. And cerebral blood flow parallels your CPP. So after maximal vasodilation here, blood vessel cannot dilate any further, your cerebral blood flow will fall as a function of your perfusion pressure because your blood vessels, after being maximally dilated, now in a low flow state, will passively collapse. In this region over here, after maximum vasoconstriction, if your perfusion pressure increases any further, blood vessels can constrict any further, so now your cerebral blood flow becomes pressure dependent, CPP, and increases hyperperfusion despite maximal vasoconstriction, causing either pressure edema, injury, or bleeding. Think hypertensive crisis. The artery regulation limits can shift depending on chronic conditions. Here also, let me give you the example of hypertension. Right? Hypertension causes a hypertrophic vascular intima, so vasodilation is more a problem, but vasoconstriction isn't. So a normal tensive artery regulation limit now here shifts over here with chronic hypertension, uncontrolled perfusion pressures. Now the vessels are, the, the, uh, uh, the muscle layer, the smooth muscle layer is getting thicker, so therefore compensates for it and your artery regulation limits will shift towards the right. The mechanism how, how the blood vessels are so smart and can do artery regulation probably has different components. Um, so there is a myogenic component, meaning there must be a way how the blood vessel measures pressure, so therefore can respond to that. A neurogenic component, because there is um, control, you know, there may be a feedback, you know, if this you know, is uh, triggered, this is the, the reason why the vasotone changes. And there also obviously is a metabolic link uh, due to the strong uh, relation between metabolic activity and uh, uh, vasodiameter. So to summarize, three mechanisms um, uh, are discussed for explaining artery regulation, myogenic, neurogenic, and metabolic. Other strong influences of cerebral blood flow is our blood gas composition, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen. The carbon dioxide probably has the strongest influence on cerebral blood flow in within a certain range between give or take 20 to 80 millimeter mercury. There's a linear change uh, between uh, your blood gas uh, concentration, your carbon dioxide, and uh, your cerebral blood flow. One cc, um, I'm sorry, like one millimeter mercury change in partial pressure of carbon dioxide um, leads to a give or take one cc um, per minute per 100 gram tissues changes in cerebral blood flow and goes both ways. So when I say within certain range, so if your uh, partial pressure of carbon uh, dioxide, your PaCO2 gets too low, there is maximal vasoconstriction, can't go any further, actually can even cause um, uh, cerebral underperfusion or um, cerebral ischemia uh, due to vasoconstriction. Up here, um, when uh, your PaCO2 is high, there's maximal vasodilation. From there on, higher increases of uh, PaCO2 will not lead to higher uh, uh, cerebral blood flow because of maximal vasodilation. So this influence of PaCO2 on uh, uh, cerebral blood flow uh, is instantaneous, but it only lasts if you continuously hyperventilate or hyperventilate. It only lasts for six to eight hours because then your CSF uh, gets compensated, shifts back to the normal pH by the bicarb concentration, and that uh, link is not present anymore. If you then change your CO2 um, 
by changing adjustments, then you actually can get a reverse or even exa more exaggerated response, which means um, if uh, your CSF has shifted back, and then your uh, blood flow even changes even further um, uh, for, uh, for based on your um, PaCO2 in the blood. Oxygen does not have as strong as an influence on cerebral blood flow as uh, CO2. Uh, high levels of oxygen really don't affect cerebral blood flow that much. However, hypoxia, hypoxemia does. The lower limit, around 50. So if your PaO2 PA drops less than 50, there will be a compensatory increase in cerebral blood flow for the lack of oxygen supply. Cerebral blood flow also is affected by temperature, by body temperature, because it decreases your metabolic activity. So every one degree of Celsius shift changes your cerebral blood flow up or down 5 to 7%. Um, you see it in the cardiac room. That's why we lower body temperature, right? That's why we got um, hypothermic, because not only does it protect the heart, it also protects the brain. Um, approximately at you know 20 degrees, you have an isoelectric EEG, and uh, you should worry in hyperthermia um, about neuronal cell injury. So let's go to the anesthetic influences on cerebral blood flow, and here we'll go through those anesthetic agents in more detailed fashion. Start with the volatile anesthetics. They do alter your metabolic rate and your cerebral blood flow coupling. Not uncoupling, but shifting the relationship, how closely it is linked. It lowers your uh, cerebral metabolic rate, but it also causes vasodilation, so therefore uh, the coupling is not intact anymore. Uh, this relationship is dose dependent and for the majority of anesthetic agents can be mitigated by hyperventilation prior to, uh, um, to uh, um, but not all of them. So this little graph here in the corner shows you the dose dependency and the agent we used here was sevoflurane from anesthetized, so there is still some form of um, autoregulation um, with half MAC but you almost have lost it at one mag and higher. Just to tell you, kind of like, not all is gone with half a mag of sevoflurane, but it has shifted somewhat. So volatile anesthetic reduced the activity, but the increase flow. And it's kind of like also called the luxury perfusion. Uh, isoflurane causes the greatest CMRO2 depression, how I think the least um, in, in like how, how much you can use isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane can cause an isoelectric EEG. While all agents cause cerebral vasodilation, increase cerebral blood flow and increase your uh, cerebral blood volume. Halothane is the worst. So at one mag, halothane probably increases uh, about to like 200% um, of, of cerebral blood flow. While isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane almost have like only 20% increase at one mag. In the neuron, you see sevoflurane uh, used the most because it has the least effect on cerebral blood flow and increases cerebral blood flow the least. Know, as the marked over here. The change in cerebral blood flow appears somewhat time dependent, and there are studies saying that it may actually return to normal limits after three to five hours exposure. Prior hyperventilation can mitigate the increase in cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume for isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane. For halothane, it's only working that way if it's initiated before you're exposing a patient to halothane. Well, we don't use halothane that often anymore in the operating room, so that's all good news. Uh, 
this is all for normal tissue, what you see over here. Uh, but since abnormal cerebral tissue does not really have normal vascular activity, um, with Walter anesthetic, there is a potential for a steel phenomenon during focal ischemia, which means cerebral blood flow increases in all areas, but not in the ischemic region, therefore underperfusing that already area at risk. Also, like, keep in mind, it's not only cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolic rate, but also your CSF production and CSF absorption. Um, uh, Desferrin, uh, because production is decreased, absorption is increased. Uh, that's a positive effect. Um, also mitigating um, the impact this agent has on cerebral blood flow. Nitrous oxide, I have it included here, only a minor impact on um, cerebral blood flow, but um, you uh, don't really um, use um, nitrous oxide a lot in the neuron because of, you know, may worsen the, no, uh, the neurocephalus, or pneumocephalus, um, if you have an open cranium. IV anesthetics, also here similar graph, and I go through the majority ones you use in the operating room. Barbiturates, uh, while very popular at some point, here you rarely use it anymore because you have better agents. So all IV anesthetic, the changes in cerebral metabolic rate parallel the changes in cerebral blood flow for all of them except ketamine. So that's the outlier, so keep that in mind, and we actually have a whole slide dedicated to ketamine. Your cerebral autoregulation, your relationship with PaCO2 remains intact. So it makes it actually the really perfect agent for neuroanesthesia. Um, barbiturates decrease the cerebral metabolic rate the most, um, but also reduce cerebral blood flow um, due to also effect on the cardiac output. Um, but it does lower your ICP if needed. Same thing is true for etomidate, but etomidate, while in a lesser degree, also can cause myoclonuses, and therefore uh, sometimes you see some spikes in ICP when you use it for induction. Um, propofol actually um, appears to be an almost perfect agent for neuroanesthesia due to effect on uh, a cerebral metabolic rate and cerebral blood flow. Um, outside of the fact it has on, on cardiac output. Uh, but that's why it's our component for the total intravenous anesthetic technique you see in the neurome used a lot. Moving on to ketamine. Ketamine is the only IV agent that causes cerebral vasodilation and increases cerebral blood flow probably due to the regional V unbalanced uh, cerebral metabolic uh, rate and increases there's where, where ketamine works it's the midbrain the limbic system there's an activation and it depresses more on the cortex somatosensitory and auditory cortex um, so overall there is really no change in cerebral metabolic rate but regionally there is and therefore representing the effect ketamine has on your um, cerebral on, on the cerebral blood flow. Is it clinically relevant? In patients with a controlled ventilation, meaning your PaCO2 responsiveness is intact and is not altered, um, ketamine really doesn't appear to increase ICP as long as it's used with, in conjunction with propofol and um, a controlled ventilation. So. As ketamine is very commonly used in trauma patients, it really has not been shown to be that much of an impact on your um, ICP, C, um, CPP, and uh, cerebral blood flow. Actually, there are some studies which has investigated that the ketamine uh, mode of action, meaning the NMDA blockade, does that offer some neuroprotections um, during cerebral ischemia because it does block the Neuro uh, the accessory um, amino acid, the glutamine concentration, 
So there's surely more research in the making, uh, but there is a possibility for actually a positive effect of ketamine um, in states of uh, one of, uh, like uh, uh, neurological injury. Other medications we use in the operating room, um, lidocaine, um, a low dose of lidocaine decreases uh, CVF and uh, uh, cerebral metabolic rate, but in a, in a lesser degree than with the other agents described, but your ICP actually goes down with a lower rate of lidocaine. Um, higher doses, as we know, would last half the potential of neurotoxicity in seizures and therefore increasing um, all those components. Opiates really not change in all those uh, neuro neurophysiological characteristics. ICP remains unchanged as long as your PACO2 doesn't change. Uh, Remifentanil can increase your CSS reabsorption, so therefore also may have an advantageous SLU component for your total intravenous technique. Neuromuscular blocker, succinylcholine, is linked to a minor increase in ICP, and that's probably due to the fasciculations um, and uh, muscle contractions. So it can be mitigated to if you use pretreatment with a non uh, uh, depolizing agent. And when I say minor increase, you feel about like a cough or so has about a, a 40 millimeter mercury increase in pressure. Succinylcholine, the ranges described are less than 15, 10 to 15. So um, you rather have a well relaxed patient doing your direct langoscopy than someone who's gagging or coughing. The inc impact of, on ICP would be worse if a patient is not fully relaxed. The non depolizing neuromuscular blocking agents, unless there's a histamine release or a ganglionic blockade um, linked to that agent, there is really no direct action on uh, cerebral blood flow or cerebral metabolic activity. Antihypertensive agents, something we also commonly use in the operating room, also affect your cerebral blood flow, your cerebral blood volume, and so therefore your ICP. So that's why I included them here in this talk. Um, uh, sodium nitride uh, through the nitric oxide in cyclic GME related vasodilation. Um, but the target is primarily the arterial vasculature, does have some impact and increases your cerebral blood volume, therefore increases your ICP. But compared to the other NO and cyclic GMP-related uh, vasodilation agent, meaning nitroglycerin, which the target is more the venous vasculature, nitroglycerin has a higher impact on cerebral blood volume and therefore ICP than nitride. Uh, the most commonly used agent in the neural room or in, in the neural population is a calcium channel blocker, near cardiphene, um, because yes, it works exclusively on the arterial, uh, arterial circulation as a calcium channel blocker, um, but uh, does not cause any dilation in, and, and therefore does not cause any dilation in the venous circulation. It uh, increases the cerebral blood volume a little bit, if it is a vasodilator, but not as much as the other agents discussed. For chronic, like, so like the nitride, nicotipine, and nitro are very short acting agents, so in the perioperative management, in tight control of uh, perfusion pressures in cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, uh, most commonly used. Um, there are longer active agents, uh, hydralazine, um, the mode of action really not well known, but the target also the arterial vasculature, but just has such a long onset and delayed action. So that's why you don't really see it used in the operating room unless at the end of the case for emergent. If you completely want to avoid vasodilation, obviously beta blockers are the better uh, pharmacologic approach than uh, targeting the blood, vesco, uh, blood vessels. So Esmolol, as a very sensitive beta blocker with a very short half-life, um, has almost no impact on your cerebral blood volume and therefore ICP. Does affect your heart rate and your cardiac output, 
Um, so cerebral blood flow still may be affected due to that, but uh, not by uh, uh, blood volume. Labetalol is a combined beta blocker, but also as an alpha-1 antagonist um, effect on the vasculature is the agent where you want to also uh, have a more longer acting control since it has a longer half-life. The blood-brain barrier. Something very unique about the central nervous system, so therefore um, I'm going to more detail um, uh, describing this for neurophysiology. Uh, there are some references uh, in your folder if you want to really, really learn about uh, this very unique feature. The function of the blood brain barrier is to really provide the central nervous structures, central nervous system structures, an almost separate compartment in our body. So be in a complete control what comes in and uh, uh, what, uh, what has to stay out. The way how it does it, it is a continuous non-fenestrated layer around the CNS. And it originated mus uh, most from the blood vessel endothelium, but there are a lot of other components which are allowed to contribute to the blood-brain barrier to allow some form of communication. So the strong component are the cerebral endothelial cells, which have very tight junctions, and in combination with the endothelial cell of the capillary, you know, here this is you know, your, your one layer, which is continuous. The pericells, the, I'm sorry, the pericytes and the endothelial cells from the basal lamina, described here as uh, uh, your basal layer one, um, uh, create one sheet, and then that contact surface is allowed to interact with glia endings, astrocytes, and microglia to allow some form of communication. So to make sure the CS, uh, the, the neurons get from the vascular compartment what the neurons need. So the astrocyte as a nurturing, supportive cells, and the microglia as a more immune system oriented cell. Um, are allowed to interact with that surface. So let's talk about the blood-brain barrier function and more or less the permeability because there, yeah, yes, there needs, there needs to be like a, uh, the nutrition and other uh, mediators and other substances allowed to cross. So some ions are allowed to uh, um, permeate neurotransmitters, um, and uh, obviously nutrition. And the permeability, like water obviously, is allowed to cross freely. As more lipophilic an agent is, um, as more it will be um, allowed to enter. The blood brain barrier prevents uh, micromolecules um, from entering, so albumin, prothrombin, uh, and plasminogen um, cannot really cross unless they're allowed. Uh, but CSF has factor 10 um, to allow some form of uh, coagulation within that compartment. Uh, the partial pressures like the PaCO2 and oxygen obviously uh, can cross the blood brain barrier by diffusion. Um, and uh, since bicarb doesn't, so it's a very low passive penetration rate, um, it needs an active transfer to uh, uh, enter and then be brought over to the CSF. Um, but that's how chronic hyperventilation is compensated. Bicarb is allowed in, and then when it's in the CSF, it cannot easily reverse to the other side. So that allows why then um, your um, CSF pH may be imbalanced. The important molecules, larger molecules, there's an active, uh, be tightly regulated active transfer. For example, glucose, uh, the free fat acids, aminoglycosides, uh, immunoglobulins. Obviously, there are mechanisms there that transport uh, molecules there to make sure the brain gets what it needs. But the brain is in full control. 
The glia cells, it's always, uh, it took me kind of wa uh, a long time to understand what does the glia really do. The astrocytes are the major glia cell type, and it's the link between the blood vessels and the neuronal circuit uh, the, for blood flow regulation, nutrition, etc., etc. Um, the immune cells that pay vascular macrophages uh, are monocytes deriv uh, derivatives. Um, they're the first line of defense by phagocytosis of the cellular debris, and they're coming from the vascular side. They can cross the blood brain barriers with active health. Inside of the compartment, the microglia, these are CNS, parenchymal immune cells. They entered the brain during the embryonic development, but these are not the ones floating back and forth. But they are part of the innate immune response, and they can act as the antigen-presenting cell inside of the CNS. Neurotransmitter, um, they will only be, um, uh, they really only can enter the um, blood brain barrier compartment unless uh, if the blood brain barrier is injured. So this allows why norepinephrine and all those substances are really not able to cross over unless they are produced by the neurons because it has such a strong stimulator um, on, on neuron activity. Since we talked about the CSF, so let's talk about it a little bit more. Um, it is the water cushion our brain structures, our C, uh, CNS swims in. So therefore protects all our structures against trauma. The CSF is produced in the coronet plexus of the lateral ventricles, here marked with the structure one in a red circle. Um, small amounts by the ventricular um, the, uh, lining with the epidermal cells, but majority from the cord plexus. And then it flows through the cerebral aqueduct, which is here number two. It goes into the, la in the fourth ventricle, uh, the foramen of Magendi. It's the medium uh, foramen or, or the lateral foramen, which is the foramen elashka. After being in three, then it flows somewhat downwards, upwards, movement around spinal cord, um, etc., um, from the cerebellar medullary system, and then it returns to the arachnoid space, structure number four, and it's absorbed, absorbed by the arachnoid granulations, structure number five, um, by translocating fluid into the cerebral venous sinuses. So that's the structure marked also with five. That's your um, uh, venous, uh, the venous sinuses, bringing it back into the systemic uh, circulation. So that's how it's produced, and the CSF flow, while it's described with the up and down movement, more and more research is actually questioning if this all goes that way. But there is an uh, up-down movement of the CSF from when it's produced in the brain, it flows down, it encases the whole spinal cord before it goes back up and then gets absorbed um, into the uh, venous sinus. How is the CSF produced? Um, it is a process through active sodium secretion and it's against a chloride gradient. The composition of the CSF is quite unique. If you look like in the, here in the uh, table I have here on the side, why the uh, pH is a little bit lower than plasma. You look at the sodium concentration, pretty much the same. Potassium a lot lower in the CSF. Calcium a lot lower in the CSF. Um, chloride a lot higher. That's why I like the active chloride gradient. Bicarb, um, we talked about this earlier, it cannot flow equally from the blood into the CSF, so there's an active, uh, uh, an active transporting process, um, but in, in uh, normal CSF it's a little bit lower than in the blood. Osmolarity is a little bit lower than the blood. Glucose concentration a lot lower than the blood. And that actually clinically has been used when you uh, uh, get fluid, when you place an epidural, you want to know if it's a red tap or not. Is that CSF you're getting back or not? 
uh, glucose concentration actually can help you to make the decision. But most remarkably, really look at the protein and the albumin concentration, CSF versus plasma, a lot lower. Almost there, last not least, intracranial pressure. The brain is in a V, and, and the brain and the spinal cord um, are in a V rigid bone compartment. So therefore, since this compartment, as rigid as it is, cannot give, um, there's no room for expansion. So the compartments our brain, CSF, and blood. So if there's any, um, if any of these components takes up more space, one other compartment has to give. Um, what it means is if the brain swells, it needs to be compensated by a reduction in CSF or blood. Okay, so that's um, you know, the uh, pathophysiology we see when we have cerebral edema. The first flexibility when the brain swells is a reduction in CSF. And uh, because like, obviously cerebral blood flow and perfusion is important, when your uh, expansion compromises blood flow, then you have a problem. Uh, the problem, that's the Monroe Kelly doctrine in this graph here described. As your intracranial volume increases, brain is swelling. Here in the first time, this gets compensated by CSF. Okay. But as the CSF is more and more squeezed out, so now over here, a small change in uh, intracranial volume, meaning a small change in brain swelling, now has a much higher impact on your intracranial pressure. So that's the Monroe Kelly doctrine. Um, and the way how it's clinically interpreted. Normal ICP, give or take 10, and if it's sustained higher than 15 millimercomogrees, that's when we talk about increased ICP. So how does it clinically look and what can we do? So this CT scan is here from someone with a normal ICP, and now brain is swelling, as it would do with a uh, traumatic brain injury, or uh, global cerebral ischemia, hypoxemia. There are no ventricles anymore. Over here, ventricle, none, all gone. Gerations, okay, the CSF swimming around the brain, here, all gone. So increase in cerebral uh, tissue, squeezed out the CSF, and now the brain is so swollen that now we have to worry about um, perfusion. So we have sustained increased intracranial pressure, about 15 millimeter mercury. Now we need to treat, so what are our options? Okay. So uh, starting physiologically, so first couple, can we do anything to reduce the brain edema? Make the swelling go away. Your osmotic therapy, diuresis, um, optimizing whatever caused that uh, state of cerebral ischemia. Um, try to make this away and prevent your secondary brain injury. Dexamethasone is only efficient when you have space-occupying lesions, um, uh, meaning uh, you know brain metastases, because uh, dexamethasone does not work for the uh, uh, visogenic uh, edema. So if we maximize the approach to reducing the cerebral edema, now can we reduce the CSF? If you still have ventricles and your brain is swelling, okay, then Place a drain. Very difficult to place a drain here. Obviously, there is no uh, ventricle anymore as a target, but here you, you know, may be able to get like, no, a drain placed in the lateral horn. Um, so drain your CSF, but also position. Physics works. Okay, If you increase um, your you know, head height, you elevate the head, then you translocate your CSF, so therefore also make some room. Uh, Azazolamide, Diamox decreases your CSF secretion, so therefore also reduces your, um, uh, your amount of CSF. Last not least, if you really have to, can we reduce the cerebral blood volume by reducing your cerebral blood flow? Obviously, if you decrease the cerebral metabolic activity, you can 
uh, also protect your neurons, but also you reduce your cerebral blood flow. We talked about the influence of temperature. You know, cooler temperature, you have less metabolic demands, and also then, therefore, less cerebral metabolic um, blood flow, um, so, uh, less cerebral blood flow. Hyperventilation, the strong link between your PaCO2 and your cerebral blood flow can be advantageous in that situation. It's instantaneous, it works immediately. However, there is a danger because if you drop your uh, PaCO2 too much, you can cause or contribute to cerebral ischemia. So the range for arterial is you want to keep your PaCO2 uh, around 28, not lower than that. If you follow your entitled CO2, that actually may be you know, even higher. So you have to determine a gradient if you follow your entitled CO2 um, to make sure your arterial CO2 is not too low, low and then contribute to your cerebral ischemia. Avoid any state of high uh, neuronal uh, metabolic demands, so therefore treat seizure activity aggressively and obviously don't use agents which cause cerebral vasodilation. It would counteract everything else to try to accomplish by reducing your uh, increment cranial pressure. If all of those measures are exhausted, last option is convert your rigid cranial vault to a not so rigid one, and that's your decompressive craniectomy. All right, to make this more interesting, I dabbled a little bit more, uh, outside of just the plain, simple neurophysiology. Um, there are more podcasts to come. So thank you so much for your attention. Again, this was the basic in neurophysiology lecture. Um, and here you see a secretariat winning the Belmont in 1973. Um, as a true Kentuckian, surely I'm a horse fanatic. So thank you so much for your attention. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions.